Well, we are back in the uh, in the game for the fifth class of the semester, and uh, I'm here with a buddy of mine. It's Umo. Say hi, Umo. Hello. We'd say hi to the camera, Umo. Hello, camera. All right, Umo's usually a little shy, but Umo here has some announcements for the class about Top Hat, don't you, Umo? Yeah, exactly. That's it. So listen, you're going to you're going to speak, right? You're going to be really clear. All right, here's what I want you to tell them. Well, oh, you know what to tell them, don't you? Yes, I know what to tell them. Okay, class. When you log into the live stream, you should be opening Top Hat 
is a second tab on your computer or open the app on your phone. Now, you're not going to get a notification from Top Hat telling you that the question is up. Exactly, Umo. If you don't hear Sam say the question is up, the question's not up. But when you hear him say it, you'll have you'll have about 30 seconds in which to see the question and answer it. So you have plenty of time. Do you understand? You have to answer the question. Make sure you have Top Hat open and ready to go. Umo, nice job. I'm quite impressed. Thank you. All right. So you can hang out if you want, or you can just watch. No, you can't watch from there. You have to like watch from the background. All right. All right, class. How's it going? That's an announcement from Umo. So the first top hat for the day is going up in about 30 seconds. Got it? Um, actually, it's going up in about 15 seconds. So just watch for it and be ready to go. All right. So listen, we have an awesome class today. Uh, Jeff, you can put the title up if you want. And uh, it is awesome class. Man. One that I've been thinking about for quite a number of weeks now. It's called Guns, Anger, and Uprising. And we have three really special guests with us today. And the first special guest are all three are Penn State grads, actually. So believe it or not, the first our first special guest is Victor Curley, who graduated in 2004 and is has been working for years and years as a senior federal law enforcement official, supervisory special agent, we could say, uh, military officer of 22 years, active National Guard Reserves when he was, in fact, a student at Penn State and working for us. I think, Vic, you took a year off to go to Serbia. I think you were deployed. Um, and a former Social 119 TA, and former wing facilitator and a trumpet virtuoso. Am I right? Trumpet? <laughs> I thought for a second you said Trump. I was about to log out. Right. <laughs> trombone, uh, yes. Trombone. Yes, I, I was a, uh, a trombone enthusiast I, in my oh, younger man. days. I always have that. I, I'd love to tell that story, but that'll be another time. You have a great story about your trump trombone experience from Penn State. So anyway, Vic, welcome. The class, man. Welcome back to Penn State. Oh, I know thank you're you. On, thank you very much, man. Yeah, you're, you're on an advisory council in liberal arts, too. So maybe some students actually have met you. Hey, our second guest is uh, JJ Hensley, a um, 1997 Penn State grad. And Jeff, you can put these, put the uh, the photos up, by the way, as we're going along here. Um, I, there's a couple of Vic photos. I don't know if you did, but please. All right, and put those up in JJ's as we go along. Uh, JJ, when you got out of college, you were a police officer in Chesterfield County, Virginia, and then you moved to the Secret Service. You were a special agent in the Secret Service for a number of years, and then you've been working in a variety of federal law enforcement positions uh, since that time. Right. Most importantly, the coolest thing, however, although people think working for the Secret Service is really cool, which it is, I mean, in the sense that you learn some things, but Another side is you are the author of seven novels, uh, mystery, right. crime, and fiction writer, and uh, which is pretty awesome. I know Jeff has a photo of, of a few of those novels, and you still can't dunk a basketball, my friend. No, no. Couldn't do it in state. Can't do it now. Yeah, maybe get one of those little mini trampolines or something. Mm. But also, hey, by the way, I want to buy one of your books for my father-in-law. Uh, who is watching as well? Which one should should I just start with the first one? What's your what's the one that has received the most notoriety? Um, my first my first one really took that's what got me really going. Um, it's called Resolve, and mm -hmm. that kind of got things started. Um, so 
that guy got me a lot of notoriety and kind of led to the other book deals from there. Um, so that, that's a good one to start with. And then I got a second series that started with a book called Bold Action Remedy and it got some notoriety as well. Cool. Awesome, man. Yeah, very cool. We'll put that in the uh, in the chat still. Hey, and our third guest is uh, Dr. Lori Mulvey, who is director of World in Conversation, who trained both Vic and JJ back in the day when they were TAs. And when Vic worked as a facilitator, what was then Race Relations Project, now is World in Conversation. And uh, she and I have had countless conversations about the issues that we're going to talk about today. But as Victor and JJ know, Lori is a skillful, skillful and experienced interviewer. And the guru of asking awesome questions as a result of that. And uh, Lori and I are actually also married, but that's kind of one, not, not she doesn't hold that, that, doesn't hold that very high on her bullet list of accomplishment. Actually, it is, it's your, be, it's your best accomplishment that you've been able to live with me, put up with me for so long. So, uh, hey, so let's go, let's go with um, Vic and, and, uh, and JJ, and either one of you can jump in, but if we take ourselves back to January 6th and what happened with the Capitol breach and the Capitol breach, uh, the question is- Hey, hey Sam, before you ask that question, yep. it, it might be, useful for the class to know a little bit about or how we were framing this. So you're going to ask this big framing question, but one, maybe an assumption that we have that, mm -hmm. um, that's, that's kind of useful is that people like JJ and Vic as law enforcement professionals and careers in law enforcement of different kinds, um, security, that kind of thing, they're going to see a moment like what we saw at the Capitol breach differently than a regular citizen or just someone not in that field. And so we want to be talking about this sociologically and in all the ways related to this class, but we're they're here particularly because they're gonna see things that the rest of us aren't going to see. And so that's, we just wanna really uh, hold that as the center of um, how you all are listening to this conversation. So. But what and but what is particularly important is they're speaking as as civilians right now. They're not speaking from their um, as government employees, or they're not speaking from their professional positions. And so we're, we'll hear some very very fascinating uh, thoughts from them. But probably they would have more that they could share if they were sitting in a small room somewhere uh, with their with their colleagues. <laughs> so uh, unfortunately. We can't get that information, but nonetheless, it's all good. So, so as law enforcement professionals, what what did you see as you watched the Capitol breach? What did you see? Let me start with JJ because you're unmuted. Oh, that's how it works. Oh, well, that was a mistake. Can, no, <laughs> sometimes <laughs> it signals ready to talk. Other times, it just means you're not paying attention. So, no, that was just me being lazy to, you know, I didn't mute. Um, so, okay, so when. What, the question was, what what did I see as it unfolded? Yep. Okay, so w I, I it was more of seeing. I guess I'll, I'll explain my reaction to it. My reaction was complete shock, but it wasn't the the shock that it happened because I mean politically, all the indicators were there that this was going to happen, and um, the the you know the cultural. Um, elements were there for so long and all the all of the red flags had been there that something like this could happen um so that that wasn't a shock to me what was surprising to me was being familiar with security operations in dc and having worked inaugurations and having worked large security events and helped coordinate these things and having worked with the with uh in conjunction with the capitol police before i knew that the capitol police had a tactical element, uh, emergency response team. I knew that they had an intelligence element, even though it's very, very small, or at least was uh, when I was um, with Secret Service, and uh, specifically with Secret Service Intelligence Division. I worked uh, hand in hand with them sometimes. Um, I knew that the Capitol Police had elements and had the ability to prepare for, um, you know, any kind of, you know, mass assault. I mean, really, I think what I saw unfold was something that was shocking to me because it was obvious they were not prepared because of, well, a variety of things I'm sure we're going to get into. 
um, but they obviously were not prepared for uh, what came at them. Uh, they were not in that in that mindset that there's something going to be occurring uh, in th this mass crowd, this huge crowd was going to be uh, not just approaching them, but was actually going to infiltrate. Um, and uh, then, you know, additionally that uh, they got caught in this in-between where if there was people coming at you, if there's people coming at you with guns, you kind of know what, it, what to do if they're shooting at you. If there's people coming at you and they're not coming at you with guns, you're kind of in this in-between place where, okay, can't use deadly force and can't really subdue them because they outnumber us. Now, what do we do? Now, you know, we, we need to outnumber them or we need to have the equipment to be able to push back. And they didn't have that. And park police wasn't there and MPD wasn't there on scene. National Guard wasn't there, which there's a variety of political reasons we'll probably get into for that. But um, so it was it was more of me being shocked that this it got that far because I thought all the red flags were there. I mean, mm -hmm. there was this was not shocking to me that it got to this level, um, especially with in the, the world of Trump. Um, but uh, it was just I, I didn't I knew what Capitol Police had faced you know, years ago with, you know, shooters and, uh, all the threats and, you know, a guy standing on the steps with a, uh, you know, suitcase claiming it was a bomb. I mean, they have, you know, the Capitol police, they have the tools, um, mm -hmm. but you know, obviously something happened that they were just not prepared. Hey, um, Nick or Vic, how about you? Well, uh, again, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sam and, and Lori for having me here today. And, um, you know, listening to JJ, I, I want to make sure that we have uh, both perspectives. And I agree, um, Phil, um, that he's said a lot of things on the technical level, um, you know, so I can go into uh, networks and chatter and discussion of um, intelligence processes. Um, how do we determine what type of uh, threat we could potentially be facing and how to mitigate those threats? But I think in order to make sure that we're covering the conversation, the discussion points. I just want to go back to what you asked about how do how did I feel? I mean, I, I I felt fear. I was afraid. I was hurt. Right. I was scared. Um, you know, those the, being a member of the of, of the government I mean, it makes me a leader, right? Uh, whether I want to or not, I'm representing uh, you know the people that we serve, and I was afraid. I was afraid that I was watching our democracy unravel. Uh, I was afraid that we haven't seen in recent times when um, the, 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 the fact that our leadership was invoking and inciting uh, the activity, I, I, felt, I felt afraid and appalled, um, helpless, right? Those questions went through my mind um, as, as I was watching um, the, the response unfold. Um, I, I had those questions, I'm, I was like, wait a minute, who, who why is this happening this way? Where's the appropriate response? Why does this look different than the preparedness that we saw during the Black Lives Matter demonstrations in Washington? Um, you know, taking taking race out of, out of the equation for a second, um, you know, there, there was a response, you know, whether we think it was excessive or not, we can talk about that later, but there was a, there was a, there was a posture in place to protect our democracy. And we, we know how to navigate around those those discussions about race when we're talking about uh, George Floyd, when we're talking about uh, things that have occurred uh, in our recent history that have been div divisive uh, for cultures that, that live and support the government. But on that day, on January 6th, I feel like all of that went out the window and I felt the need to, to reevaluate what was going on. So let's let's just steer right into race then um thanks for both your opening responses so one of them as the two of you know um, one of the most common conversations in, in the world that Lori and i are in is that this represented a, a troubling window i think we could say into privileges of being white and so there were a number of kind of common things bullet points that people were saying i mean i'll list a few off right law enforcement leadership didn't consider uh, these people a threat, largely because they were white. Um, and again, these are the, the statements going around. So I, I want to unpack them a little bit um, because this is social 19 and this is what we talk about. 
uh, these same leaders didn't call in reinforcements, even after the, the rioters were violently attacking police. Um, and so, you know, we have, we have, is first off, Jeff, can you put that one slide up to just show how many people were there? And this, I think, goes to what what both of you said, right? Intel, like kind of really saying how many how many folks were, the, the, people really don't have a sense of, you know, how many. And then the next slide, Jeff, just that, just showing just this clash. Uh, so another thing people really commonly said is police didn't seem, and this is in a way you kind of said it, but police didn't seem to respond with the appropriate force. Um, and again, you know, I think you don't, you don't know how to respond. This is, I, JJ, we can say more about that, uh, but, but to an obvious threat. And, and in fact, some of them seem to support the rioters, right? We have that common photo of the police officer taking a, a selfie uh, with folks. And that this is all uh, the more troubling given that um, some of these people might have killed some legislators had they gotten their hands on them. I mean, you know, they were preparing, it would seem anyway. So then the question, if I could just turn to this question, so how much of what was happening was based on structural racism and structural white supremacy? Where's, how does race weave into this? Did we lose Vic or is, did he just... No, there you are, man. There he right. is. So how... Uh, I'm here. Yeah, so how do... So once again, so how much of, of what happened um, was based on structural racism and structural white supremacy, right? What are, what are the actual, and Lori, did you want to get more pointed with that? No, or? no, I just, first of all, just sort of in broad brush strokes, like when you look at that moment and, you know, everything that happened, what, in your mind, how much of it was a structural white supremacy issue and how much of it was other things? But like, just first, like, just go at it broad brush strokes. Well, I certainly have, I have trouble looking at it. I can't look at it in a vacuum. I can't look at what happened to the Capitol and say, um, you know, that, you know, what happened with the insurrection at the Capitol was, um, you know, that specific moment was based on white supremacy. I have to go back and I have to look at Charlottesville. I have, you know, find people on both sides. I have to look at Kenosha, the PD handing out water bottles to militia members while you can hear in the background, um, you know, PA speakers telling the uh, mostly African-American protesters to get inside because it's past curfew. Um, so I, yeah, I think, you know, a lot of it is based in, in white supremacy and, and also this, there's probably an ingrained concept, uh, that, you know, Hey, the white people are just aren't as big of a threat, you know, so it's, it's, so, it's going to be cool. So JJ, just before we go to Vic, um, one thing that I saw, I personally saw some footage, who knows, a week later, perhaps of DC, downtown DC, the mm -hmm. night before, uh, so January 5th. And it was pretty raucous there. Like you know, folks who were there were 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 raucous, right? So to so when you when you say like ugh, white supremacy, not so much of a threat. I in watching that video, those those that video footage, I'm like that was threatening then. So right. where how does it get not translated into a threat? You know what I mean? Like what's the mechanism? And then I want Vic to weigh in on it. But what do you mean when you say that these people might not be seen as the same level of threat? Maybe maybe it's not they're not seen as the level that they can get away with more. Maybe it maybe that's the way the way I should explain it is that I I think that there's this mentality um, and it's not obviously everybody in law enforcement but there seems to be this mentality of hey you, you know these these are the, these white people they're not going to cause us harm because they're, they're you know they're the ones where even the you know back to blue flags the the blue line the, you know the thin blue line flags um, you know they they have this Punisher symbols, um, you know, all this ridiculous symbolism that you know doesn't mean what they think it means, um, and it obviously it, that ended up you know being a bunch of crap um, as they ended up beating on police officers. Um, so they there's been this weird alliance between you know these I, I'm not even call them white militia members because a lot of them aren't really tied to militias, but these uh, white supremacists or these white activists and law enforcement where they uh, there's some has been a kinship at times um especially in in certain areas and so there, so there I, was an assumption like that kinship right. was sort of a, a prevailing assumption so I, right. i'm gonna just pause right and just get victor to to kind of weigh in before we keep going sure. yeah so same same realm Vic. 
Well, uh, I mean, I want to start off by saying is uh, when we're talking about game time, and uh, JJ alluded to the uh, you know the use of force, um, the the laws that govern, and the legal precedent that govern uh, whether we can take lethal force or lethal actions uh, to subdue somebody, and how complicated that can be at the time. So I want to just point out so we don't get lost in the and before we get deep into the I won't say lost, but deep into the race discussion. Um, at, once it's game time and you're a law enforcement officer and you're you're there fighting for your life, I mean, I go back to um, doing the uh, January 6th uh, law enforcement officer, uh, Sicknick, who lost his life, unfortunately, um, due to the actions at the Capitol. Um, you have a civilian, uh, Ashley Babbitt, um, who was, uh, was killed by police um, while she was attempting to enter. I don't know if you all have looked into her background, but there's a lot of things out there in the open. Uh, I'm just going to put out a few factors. Uh, she was a member of the D.C. Air National Guard, uh, formerly uh, responsible for uh, providing security to the nation's capital um, through training and by mission. Uh, she was uh, definitely a person that uh, planned prior to the events uh, transpiring on January 6th, uh, planned to engage in some activity at that time based on what's available in uh, open source and social media. Um, there's chatter, there's a movement. So when we talk about race and how it impacted, as a law enforcement officer, I do have to separate what transpired at that moment while that uh, those act actions and activities were occurring at the Capitol building, because I don't yes. believe that. Keep going on that, Vic, definitely say more. Yeah, I, I don't believe at the time when uh, the Capitol Police officer uh, fired his service weapon and, and killed Ashley Babbitt, that either one of them were anywhere concerned about what, what race one person was or the other person was. Uh, I don't believe that Officer Sicknick, when he was defending the Capitol building, I don't believe that he threw his, his body in, in harm's way um, based on any type of racial uh, uh, underlying factors. You know, I believe that race came into a factor way before we got to the Capitol building, right? Underlying social situations that um, that contribute to that. And I want to highlight just, just again, I, I feel like I'm touching a lot of areas, but I do want to just bring this out there. But um, if you look at what's transpired in the last two to three years, the images, the Black Lives Matter movement has been around for several years. Um, it, it, it hasn't really uh, take, hadn't really taken form until recently uh, surrounding uh, certain events. But if you go right now and look in Google Images, uh, and you look at BLM, you look for BLM. Now, let's consider that you're on an extremist side of the house. Say you're a radical uh, racist and you don't believe in your white supremacist. Let's just say you're a white supremacist and you're searching to find out what the Black Lives Matter movement is doing. You're going to find images of Black Lives Matter tags on monuments and, and uh, in cemeteries and things like that. This is psychological operations, right? Psycholog it's psychological warfare. Okay, if you want to recruit people from a certain cross section, you put out these images. Uh, you have the news media that's putting out certain images, and you get a base and a finding. So, uh, what I believe is what's happened. If, if you look at the cross section of people that were at the Capitol, um, there, there's not just one organization. You can't just say this is the Ku Klux Klan. This mm -hmm. is. Uh, you can't just say this is this is Q and QAnon. You can't just say it's not just QAnon. It's not. There's not one cross section of people. My fear is that systematic social injustice and racism is causing the, the extremist following um, to broaden itself wide enough to where we can get to a point where, the, where a sitting official, I won't say, I, I might say 45, I, might, I don't wanna blame it all on just one person, I don't wanna put myself out there like that, but one person can be all it takes to get enough people that are like-minded across the spectrum that they can actually arrive at the Capitol building with the support and backing of your boss's 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 boss, which is the president of the United States, and put those people that are safeguarding our democracy at a decision point that they're not at the pay grade that they should have to be making that decision. And you have what transpired at the Capitol building. So go ahead, Lori. <laughs> so can the two of you help us to understand, because I think if I'm getting what you're saying, there is there are there's context and there's history that would lead at least when we think about like race and culture and social justice things to that moment. And then there's also like you said, Vic, game day things that you know law enforcement like what, things that are going on. So can you 
for people who don't know, help us parse that out. Help us parse mm -hmm. where we should meaningfully see that inequities because of race were in play and where were we seeing other things that were in place so that we can start thinking about this more deeply. Yeah, in particular that there there's sort of two side two things that are that are that I see in play. One is that not seeing this particular group of people as as a, the kind of threat that it actually was. And and probably you know there there it's it's obvious that they were even with basic intelligence. So like the with the some so therefore is this a willful attempt to by some people to just turn their a blind eye on something that should have been really obvious like how much of that is yeah that's a closed-ended question but how much of that is in play so maybe so, jj go ahead so i don't know how much of it was willful and i'm not i'm not big on conspiracy theories i mean mm -hmm, obviously mm -hmm. there was there was something same here that by the way yeah same yeah there, there's some I mean, and, and i always tell people you know never underestimate the amount of incompetence that happens in government bureaucracies and people will sometimes interpret in inefficiency and incompetence as a conspiracy it's not so you know sometimes it's just really bad um but the, with the national guard being withheld and stuff like that yeah that that there's some stuff going on with that but i tend to think that there's a little bit more going on on the subconscious with some of the people who were making decisions with Capitol Police and whatnot, maybe the um, the sergeant of arms and and whatnot. A lot of whether you know whether they want to acknowledge it or not, a lot of the people in law enforcement, you know, are um, more on the conservative side. They they vote conservative. They are uh, strongly Republican voters, and with this Trump movement, um, they started really latching onto it. And I think a lot of them, they started seeing themselves with, they started seeing a lot of themselves with the people who were demonstrating on behalf of Trump. I'm not saying that they were supporting what they were doing uh -huh. openly, but they were saying, well, they, they wouldn't do anything like attack the Capitol, mm -hmm. you know, violently because I wouldn't, because that's that I can see myself in them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I wouldn't do that because I love, you know, I love my country and, you know, I wouldn't beat on a cop because I am a cop. Mm -hmm. So they wouldn't do anything like that. Look at that. They got the thin, you know, they got the thin blue line flag. They're saying back the blue. So we're, we're cool. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, and then they took the big, the thin blue line flag and they started beating the hell out of cops. Mm -hmm. So they're just for you, a really powerful subconscious element that that's going on. That was not, explicit necessarily, but you think was implicit in how some decisions were being made to manage this crowd or this particular group. Yeah, yeah, I think there's a, you know, and still still being associated in, in the law enforcement field, I still see it, I still see, you know, a lot of right, you know, uh, it's, well, it's right wing, a lot of right wing thinking. And it's, it's really shocking how it's even still, even after what we saw on January 6th, how it's still persisting. And, you know, it's like, well, what does it take? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what does it take? What does it take to, to change your mindset? I also, maybe this isn't in this moment, but maybe it's like something we can talk about in a little bit, but if you either of you had something to say, I also wanna um, see what you think about the idea that in any kind of um, movement, you're always going to have the people who go too far, right? There's there's activists and people who are pushing and disrupting um, for good reason, and then there's the people who become violent, and then the movement gets seen in you know in relationship to that extreme those extreme acts. I mean. Uh, uprisings that happen downtown in State College after a football game, right? Five people do something and now the whole thing is cast in that way. So I just wanna, I wonder also, um, is there a place for us to talk about some of that? Like how how different this crowd was from other crowds? I also, I don't wanna cast everyone in the crowd as the same thing, but, but again, I'm, I'm only, I'm asking. And I maybe Vic, you could jump in. Is there? Is, yeah, Vic, that, you actually, you asked a question in the chat, Vic. You throw that out there and kick it around. Yeah. yeah. I did feel this is relevant to uh, where Lori was going. Um, you know, what, what differences would it, would we have seen if a black president called for action at the U.S. Capitol to impede peaceful transfer to a white president? Yeah. And <laughs> I, I asked this question um, because 
I believe that when we talk about is race a factor, I, it is a factor in our country. And unfortunately, I, I just feel like it always is. What is not a factor, what should not be a factor, is whether the leadership of our country is willing to incite any type of activity to overthrow our democracy or to intervene in democracy. So um, my, my feeling of pain what I, I believe was shared by a lot of our members of the of the uh, of the House and the Senate is that it's it's just we're not we didn't know how to respond. Law enforcement did not know how to respond mm. when it was it was coming. It wasn't coming from an organization. Okay, when we're listening to chatter and we're focusing on um, you know what leaders of, per, of of particular groups are saying that they might do. There was a lot of involvement, and I, again, I, I can't go into into specific on details, especially things that I was not directly uh, responsible for overseeing or, or responsible for. But um, it, apparently, if you're watching the news, it, it just seems like there's a lot of engagement from uh, from 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 higher levels of uh, leadership in our government um, in the response uh, during the demonstrations in Washington D.C. Um, you know, so. Um, with this case, I don't. In January six, I don't see that as being much different. I mean, there, there. Again, this is a difficult situation, one that we're not used to seeing. If President Obama, who was a uh, black male, um, you know, race is involved here, but if 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 he was on um, television and he was, you know, telling his followers of, let's just say, I won't say a particular organization, but uh, a predominantly like, you know, minded and, mm-hmm. and like racial uh, com- composition organization. To go down to the to the Capitol and you know stop this stop this steal you know stop the steal so to speak and send them downtown. How many people would find that appalling enough to say maybe I need to step in and make sure that this doesn't happen? Mm-hmm. Um, and we didn't see that per se happen in this situation, and uh, it's 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 complicated. And yeah, and, is, and how many? Me, can I just? Yeah, go ahead. This make this it makes this. Um, just unpacking this moment so difficult because, um, you know, we have a activist president, if you will, right? This is like a factor that we have not seen. It's so hard to know, I mean, to account for that. I mean, we can't not account for that, right? So, so then I, what if, let us, let's just assume foundationally in this conversation that race is a factor, just like you were, you were saying, Victor. So let's, talk about, if, if Sam, if this is okay with you, just like, mm-hmm. tell us more about, um, we want, you know, for, for all of us, you know, and particularly for the Social 119 students, we want to be smarter about how we think about this as a, as a result of this conversation with the two of you. So like, help us to see where should we be thinking race was explicitly in play as we started to talk about, and where should we realize other things were in play? Right, other things like you refer, um, that we don't know how to think about as civilians. Right? So, Can you help us to to parse that? So, for for example, when JJ, I think it was you who said earlier about you know you're trained to respond to people with weapons or people without weapons, but now you're suddenly in this in between place where people are beating, coming after you with these with pole with all sorts of things, right? And. Right. And how do you how do you respond? Like it's this middle ground. And but but what it looks like from my perspective as someone who's not in law enforcement is y'all are like, I was watching video and I'm like, I'm watching this police officer and I'm like, take your baton, dude, and jam it right in that dude's face, man. Like he's he was saying that he was right in his eye, man. Get him and, to stop. He's trying to kill you. Like, come on. Like, and I'm rooting for the you know, and, and there think- was like incredible restraint at the same time that many of us were saying you have to use more force right so these are so pieces. another side is like well yeah because you're a white guy he's a white guy and that's really simple and a lot of people and a lot of my students of course that's and a lot of americans they just take that really simple approach so i think what Lori is saying yeah, let, let's just parse it out we, we've already help done it a little bit help us to get bit, smarter but, help keep keep talking and help us to get smarter about how we could think about this more meaningfully yeah, and, and it's obviously it's hard when you're looking at each individual officer to know how they're going to respond to somebody, whether they're white or black and, and whatnot. So just looking at it from the use of force point of view, um, first of all, you wouldn't, you know, if, if somebody is actually threatening your life, all bets are off and you can use whatever deadly force you, you deem appropriate. Um, it, in that situation at the Capitol, that was 
so terrifying just because of the sheer numbers of people. So uh -huh. I, I, I saw an interview with one of the um, DC police officers, MPD. Um, he was, uh, you know, saying he was fearful that if he took his gun out, it was going to get taken away from him. You know, because what you, once you have it in your holster, you can kind of lock it down, and you have a chance to keep to retain your weapon. And they had so more you, guns, right? They yeah, were just concealed, but they had far more guns than than and even, anybody yeah. knew. And even if you even if they didn't, you know, the numbers they're going to take it away from you, and mm -hmm. and you're you're taught from day one in any police academy, every encounter you have involves a weapon. Yours, you can always get killed with your own weapon. So. Um, you that was those encounters i kept seeing them over and over again um it both outside and inside the capitol it was so terrifying because you kept saying what you know what would you do in that situation where you're you know do you hit them with a baton and then the next person steps up and you try to hit them with a baton but then they just swarm you because you just antagonize the the group and now that you are going to get killed um are you going to you know open fire are you going to uh, you know, try to, you know, throw punches. And because once you, you know, go that that next level up, you know that they're going to escalate. And if, if it's 10 on one, it's not going to turn out well for the one. Um, this, this isn't, you know, people always say, well, you know, the police officers are trained. They don't, it's not a Steven Seagal movie from the, you know, from the 90s. And, you know, you're not going to be throwing people around and, and it's not, yeah, we don't know some sort of secret type of Kung Fu. It doesn't so, work that way. <laughs> so JJ, some of what you're saying, just to like say it in the way I was asking it, um, just for the benefit of, of clarity, is that, um, so there's a partly, and that you said earlier, it's mentality. Maybe there's some kind of kinship that people feel with this group of people, just given who they are. But then there's this other piece, so that when we're looking at this and we're seeing like, why aren't you responding with more force? There, there was that piece, and now there's this piece, which is, I can't afford to have my gun taken away from me. I can't afford to be swarmed by other, by, the, by this mob of people, no matter who they are. So now we have like those two things are in play at the same time, Call maybe looking the same, but there's different streams coming in, different threads coming in, right? This kinship thread, and now this like, what do I do with this mob swarming right now, or pr pr protecting myself and others, right? Like that's what I'm hearing is like another consideration. Well, I think like Vic said, I think the, the kinship part probably came in on the preparation part, the lack of preparation part. I oh, think I once think. once they started pushing against the officers and started there started to be conflict, I think they didn't they probably didn't see a difference in race. They didn't see anything as far as a kinship there. And, and you got to remember these Capitol Police officers, the MPD officers, they, they're scared. I mean, they, they, mm -hmm. it's scary if you were confronted and, and Vic's probably been there. I've been there. If you're confronted by a, a group of individuals, it doesn't matter how much training you've had. It doesn't matter what weapons you have. If they're yelling and screaming, they're violent. It is a scary situation. Yep. Your adrenaline's up, and yep. and you, you know you you know that you you could be seconds away from not seeing your wife, not seeing your kids, not seeing your spouse, whatever yep. you know. Who, you, you, it could be over. So so Vic, what would you add to that as we're just trying to like parse what how to look at this? What would you add? Well, I think we're we're starting to carve out, you know, pre January sixth, January sixth, and then post January sixth, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I agree one hundred percent with JJ. Um, at that time, when you're on the X, i.e., you're facing an angry mob, and all you have is your sidearm, um, you have very little resources to to fend off uh, a, a crowd of that sort. And I want to remind everybody that um, there were, you know, I there were pipe bound pipe bombs that were found at both the RNC and the DC DNC. Um, there was intent, there was intent amongst uh, many of the uh, members in the crowd. Um, apparently there was apparently an intent to, to cause violence and, 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 and to, to take acts and lives, lives were lost. I know that number five can be a little bit misleading based on, um, you know, some of the circumstances surrounding some of the deaths, but at the end of the day, lives were lost and there was some intent behind that. Um, so when you're a law enforcement officer and some individuals are, are, are exercising their right to, uh, to demonstrate and voice their opposition to, um, to the outcome of the election, uh, some, some folks were actually there to, to, to cause anarchy, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. my, to, in my and, opinion. And, 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 and would have killed people had they had the opportunity. And, I mean, I don't know. And, and did. I mean, the, the officer Signick was bashing the head with a fire extinguisher. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So I, I, I almost can't even say that. Um, 
you know, I, I just can't even speak it. it, it it's horrific. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so is race a factor in that? Again, in the pre phases, yes. How do they get there? Some deep rooted evil hatred got them to that point. But when Officer Sicknick was facing that angry mob, uh, you know, I don't think race was a factor. So uh, he was defending what the, he was defending the Constitution, of the United States, and 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 performing his service and duties. And if you hate him because he's a law enforcement officer, then we we can't get along, right? Because mm-hmm. you know, the law enforcement we we have an inherent mission to protect everyone. Now, there's going to be people in our positions in law enforcement that have uh, different upbringings, different views politically, socially, so you know, have different socioeconomic status. And how you deal with that, I'm going to tell you something. From my experience, I can never introduce my personal feelings or belief in the way that I carry out my job, ever. Mm-hmm. So if I don't agree with the law, the policies, et cetera, I cannot allow that to impede my uh, rationality. One thing I do want to say, I know I've been talking a lot, I put another question in there. And the question is, is it just trying to shape out the aftermath, right? The aftermath uh, question. So Ooh, what if doing a hypothetical? Well, hey, Vic, before you, before you do that, could I, you, you were also pointing to the pre and, and then after, and I wonder, could we talk about the pre before we get to the aftermath? Because I really think it's important to hear from the two of you about where you think the breakdowns were and where you think the race piece was and wasn't in that, all of the stuff that led up to it. I mean, yeah, and, and, and JJ, I mean, you, you, you were in the Secret Service, right? So I mean, you've worked some of these, you know, like, how did they miss this? Especially as Lori said, the night before, is that a purely political thing? Like just knuckle. Yeah, just, just tell us. Give us some insight into how you, as you know, are thinking about the pre. <laughs> I like how you said that, Vic. Just talk to us about that. Okay, so uh, for for much of the time I was in the Secret Service, I was with their intelligence division. I, w- I worked protective intelligence cases. So one thing I can tell you, and, and something that always irks me when I see it in the news, is they say, "Well, there was chatter beforehand that that there was going to be trouble." Well, I can tell you this: there's always chatter. There's yeah. always chatter. There's a flood of chatter about everything. Yeah. It's a matter of finding, sorting through the chatter and is there escalated chatter and is it you know going to be, um, is there anything that's really actionable? In this case, I mean, you could watch CNN and see that there is going to be a, a demonstration. They were building gallows out there. They, they, they ordered sweatshirts. I mean, this stuff was out there. There was, there was obviously going to be a mass demonstration and the president of the United States was telling people to show up. That was a, a huge difference. So th- there was obviously actionable intelligence that there could be, there was a potential for something bad to happen. Um, not, and not just bad, but really bad. Really bad. Um, it, it, you know, at a minimum, there was the, the chance for people to approach the Capitol and go after Congress members after they left the Capitol, mm-hmm. you know, at, at a minimum. Um, so the, you know, in my opinion, the, the, the breakdown here lied somewhere. If I'm, if the reports are correct about how the, the structure goes with the Sergeant of arms. And, and this is what baffles me is because having worked a lot of protective operations in DC and knowing that both, both Sergeant of Arms had worked for the Secret Service, and one of whom I I, I knew when I was in the Washington D.C. office with Secret Service. They they had to have known that there was potential for this because they had worked so many major events and so many major demonstrations. Um, that's where I think that there's that that mentality of yeah yeah, but these are these are Trump supporters. They're the ones who who you know, say back the blue. They're the ones who support law mm-hmm. enforcement. They're the ones who you know, say they believe in democracy. Um, so, you know, we don't need to escalate this like we would for Black Lives Matter because they're dangerous. I think that's where there's the lapse and that's what that's why we didn't see the preparation that we norm, that we would have if there was, you know, uh, a different group out there. Vic, can you respond to that directly? Like, do you agree, disagree? Oh, I I agree. I mean, I, I, would, I would focus in, uh, well, for the most part, um, the, the one thing that well, the one spot and JJ is the one area where I would kind of reshape it from my, from my experience. Um, I, I can't categorize 
Well, I, I can make an analogy, okay? Categorizing uh, pro-law enforcement and, you know, patriots to uh, the individuals that were involved in um, in the incident at the Capitol building, to me, would be likening um, the Muslim faith to Al-Qaeda. Because mm -hmm. I believe what we have is a radicalization process that's been happening, um, hidden under the cloak of patriotism, mm -hmm. right? Going back to uh, Ashley Babbitt, she was a 14-year uh, Air Force veteran, right? A couple tours overseas, um, D.C. National Guard. Um, how did she become radicalized? You know, there was a radicalization that that transpired really in the last three to two, you know three to four years. Um, if you were to look at her uh, open source um, media, uh, hey, can, social media. Go go ahead, Jeff. Can you can you put up that one photo of the folks on the steps in Lansing? Uh, the militia group. Um, it just that you you remember the the guy who are who are these guys here? This is the you know these are the folks in the steps in Lansing. Who who are? I don't mean like what group they're in. Like who are they? Are you saying that Sam in relationship to this radicalization? Yeah, this what, idea? what Vic what Vic just said. Like uh -huh. who, you see those guys. Who are they're all there with their guns, man. They are like. Did you did you see that? Yeah. You know? Oh, you're muted, Vic. I, I'm not able to, to see the photo that you're sharing. Jeff, but, can I you mean, put it, it back up? Just, um, you know, uh, okay. speaking speaking in generalities and not talking about you know you know particular organizations or groups, um, we're very much accustomed to observing and noticing um, radicalization trends. Okay, normally that's we've it, we've had a different perspective. Normally that's sitting inside our you know, our skiffs, our intelligence cells, our, our, our law enforcement entities that have a particular mission related to this and um, finding tip, tippers, uh, you know, tipping and queuing, basically finding, you know, individuals that are people of influence that have uh, extremist radical uh, views. Uh, how are they furthering that by doing certain things, you know, uh, massing weapons, um, instructing others, influencing others, you know, traveling, moving around in order to further out and recruit uh, and, and, and spreading uh, is, uh, radical views. Uh, so there's, there's a whole process that we've developed to look at homegrown terrorists, for example, homegrown violent extremists. Um, so we have new information. I mean, this is, and I'm not talking about from, you know, internal information uh, from my perspective and my position, but we, anybody watching the news and the media and, and trying to dissect what transpired at the Capitol building, we have something slightly new that's happening. So we have this overlap in patriotism, you saw American flags. You saw American flag fl flags bearing the sitting president's name. You saw Confederate flags. You saw so, so some wait, Black Matter flags. Just to, just to cl just to clarify. So, are you saying also that there is um, this radicalization and violent extremism that we would be identifying and do identify in other realms? That this caught us by surprise because it's homegrown. It, it, yeah, that? yeah. I mean, it, well, I do want to point out that this is not. I'm not speaking only on the Capitol. I mean, this this could go into yeah. this could go into the BLM and into Antifa because you have you you're going to have the 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 general consensus of why we're here and what our values are. But like JJ alluded to before, you're always, you're also going to have those extremist cells in there that mm -hmm. that want to see violence. They mm -hmm. want to see anarchy. And there's a process. There's a recruitment process. There's a radicalization process. Uh, social media is heavily involved in that, um, and it it just this is just a new flavor of it, um, based on you know where the United States was you know for the last several years and leading up to what transpired on January six. Mm -hmm. And so, this is in the pre phase. In the pre still, because I I'm dying to go to the post, but okay. no, but in wait. the pre. But no, I think go ahead. But honestly, what you all are saying, I think really it, it does make us, is making us smarter, right? Because now you're complicating, a, which is what we want to do, right? So there's a, there's a part of this, which is about uh, structural racism or white supremacy type pieces where we might've had a different view of the folks there, ideological. And now you're like radicalization that is perhaps new or there's a new flavor to it. Um, and to me, and, and that's and, like- and planning for the violent, these are almost entirely white people planning for the violent overthrow of the United States. It's what I'm just reading from basic, even 
watching Fox News. I've got, this is not coming from MSNBC and left-wing channels. This is coming from just standard information that's out there for all to see. Like th These are groups that are seeking and planning for and thinking about the violent overthrow of the United States. So here, I have another question for the two of you. Um, and, and and we're gonna go to the aftermath, so don't don't worry. Um, but so there was I um, observed a lot of conversation about in the planning beforehand, like what was the mayor asking for and what was the MPD doing and what was the, this and that. So can we talk about some of that in relationship to the pre and the pre meaning also where does race and culture fit into that? Can, can you help us to understand some of those dimensions of the pre? JJ, maybe you. What what aspect specifically well, are you referring to? I, I guess it's so. Um, I just I'm wanting to understand that anything we look at, I want to see like where is the the race and the inequity social inequity piece, and what is other things that folks in law like bureaucracy. Enforcement like there are thirty different law enforcement organizations or units within DC, like 30 in there. Right. I mean, we're we're including like the Washington Zoo, right? But the point is like this this is. On one hand, you could just wipe it away and say, oh, yeah, this is really complicated. But on the other hand, it's like, well, hang on, it is complicated, but it's not over here, right? Yeah, so, sort of like you were saying earlier that some things are, there's incompetence, not necessarily a conspiracy all the time, right? So like, again, so help us to parse in this pre-time, what are the things that were going on in terms of planning and, and how is the social issues re relevant and how is it bureaucratic and things that we haven't talked about yet? Yeah, and, and and not being an expert on how the the bureaucratic ladder works on on how Capitol Police was requesting it, but I've I've read the reports about how it goes through the Sergeant of Arms and how they were making requests to the National Guard and whatnot. It is you know, and I and I've already commented on how I believe race was probably a factor at that level with the the Sergeant of Arms level. Now you're you know, now we're drifting to the part where okay, now it's jurisdiction, um, and there is a certain level of Hey, Capitol Police has got this. The, the 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 same mentality I had, you know, where, you know, yeah, it's Capitol Police. They got that emergency response. They've got, you know, they they've got this because, you know, they they've got all the elements. They've got the tools. Um, they've been you know preparing for you know the worst for you know since September 11th, 2001. I mean, they they can deal with this, right? Um, and all these other entities, they wouldn't have necessarily known you know, what was going on in, inside. Uh, just because agencies are close to each other doesn't mean they're talking. Um, mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't know all the inner workings of, you know, uh, exactly what they, you know, were requesting from MPD and, you know, what they weren't. Um, I, I, I was kind of surprised that Park Police wasn't, didn't have more of a presence there. What surprised me, and I know we're still talking about the pre, what did surprise me was when the attack occurred that, there weren't officers from everywhere just swarming the Capitol. I mean, you can't go, you know, you can't go through Washington, D.C., having lived in that area for so many years. You can't go and you can't throw a baseball and not hit a Starbucks or a cop. I mean, you, you just can't. So how in the world were there not just officers swarming there from every jurisdiction, the Supreme Court police, the FBI police, the, you know, the Mint police, uh, you know, BEP, I mean, everybody should be, you know, helping out and it just wasn't happening. So uh, that that was just shocking to me that there weren't people just swarming. Mm. Vic, do you want to add to that? And then I want to get to the post because I got, I think we have a lot to say about where we're at right now. No, I'll, I'll keep it short. Uh, I just want to reiterate that uh, the U.S. Capitol is not a soft target. Um, like JJ pointed out, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of sworn law enforcement officers in in in, in the district. Um, it just goes back to our discussion before about you know what how how this uh, how this crowd arrived there. Um, what were their values? What led up to them being there? I think the pre lies in um, certain ir irresponsible acts that 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 contributed to them being there without being matched by a force. I I, I want to remind everybody. Leading up to the uh, to the election, um, if you went into uh, the D.C. area and tried to see the White House or tried to move around and 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 have some Starbucks, uh, there was very restricted movement. Um, the city was was on lockdown, and that was uh, at, you know at the fear of certain organizations. Um, and I, I, you you would think that there was um, 
I have to be careful how I address the, the how I shape that. But if the outcome had been different from the election, there probably would have been um, a reasonable person would have assumed there would have been some rioting that would have transpired um, in the D.C., Maryland uh, area, um, very blue areas. Um, so um, you probably would have seen, you, you know, a reasonable person would have would have uh, expected to see some unrest in the in the nation's capital. Um, and the nation's capital was prepared. Um, there was, it was, it was, it was not, it was, it was a hard target if you wanted to have any, any type of uh, collective um, uh, demonstration going on in the DC area. So, so, can, you so say one, can I ask one more pointed question before we get ahead. to the, and this can be quick, but um, again, not following this like a scholar and just as a citizen reading news in different places, one of the, one of the threads was something that uh, about, um, the DC mayor's office and um, an MPD talking to, was it Capitol Police? I don't know, but about not um, reproducing the situation uh, that had the optics of what had occurred in the summer with Black Lives Matter in DC. Like, is there, can you say, first of all, I don't know how true that is and if that was a factor or, and can could, could you, could either of you speak to that at all it was there was did that like come the, into like so with with the blm protest the police present was a little bit overboard so there was like this pressure to pull back and just keep pulling back pulling back pulling back my understanding was that the mayor's office had requested that they not overdo i don't know what the proper law enforcement terms are but can you speak to whether that's true or you know about it or any any aspect of that I, I don't know. I mean, my memories of the protests over the summer, you know, my, the ones that stick in my head are, you know, of the unidentified officers from federal entities that showed up and are, you know, were standing around, um, not MPD. Um, mm -hmm. That's, and that, which, that's what bothered me most was the ones that had no, you know, had patches hidden and, and uh, you know, we're staying around in helmets. So uh, I, I I don't know about the MPD part of it in this yep. case. And, and and I think I'd just add on that. I mean, I, I think we're referring to uh, hitting protesters with uh, rubber bullets, right? You know, the response that was seen um, around the world. Um, I, I definitely I definitely you know professionally believe that's a bit that was a bit much. So uh, whether that. Uh, took a part in uh, the response at the Capitol. Above my pay grade, I do not know. Oh. I, I, I don't so just, know. Okay. okay, so we're going to go to post right here. But first, uh, class, we are the next top hat question is going to be going up in just about 15 or 20 seconds. So you can uh, be on the lookout for it. And got it? All right, so let's go. So I am, as somebody who, gentlemen, and Dr. Mulvey, when I just take a step outside of this and look at it as just as objectively as I possibly can, and I think, hmm, we have this leadership who called, essentially called for the overthrow of the, the United States in a way, because that's what this is, essentially, right? We call for overthrowing elections one after another and calling this group of people down to take over this the Capitol building. You're basically... This is essentially what a coup d'etat looks for and is looks like, right? I was living in Madrid, Spain in 1982 when the coup d'etat happened at the at the courthouse right around the corner from me. And basically it was a couple tanks and some army officers went in and took over the courthouse and they they held the country for a day. Um, and then I think of what has happened after that which is very little actually. Very, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen, but I think wow, this is really big and it's kind of off the news cycle in a certain sense. And I, and I think if I'm thinking like you, I'm just thinking, all I can say is, wow, this is so big. And it's just, it's like, it's going to go away. Can you? Are you saying how? How is it? How? So, like, what how do you? Mean? What do you? Yeah, what's that mean? Like, where? Where yeah. are we going? Right, and that, I think this is part of what we've been conditioned for over the past four four plus years now. Um, you know, we've we've been dealing with this for for you know over and over again since since Trump was elected, where you know, 
the Hatch Act was violated over and over and over again, no consequences. Uh, rules were broken over and over again, no consequences. Enforcement mechanisms, inspector generals fired over and over again, no consequences, no no retribution. Um, you know, uh, impeached the first time, obviously that was not going to, there was not going to be a conviction on that one. And now, you know, I, I you know, I very seriously doubt he gets con convicted this time and there'll be no ramifications for this insurrection. It, it's almost like we've been desensitized to being overthrown. Um, and Vic and I have signed paperwork in the, you know, at different times that we have, you know, we, we check a box that says we have never, we, you know, we've, we don't uh, advocate the violent overthrow of the United States government. And if there's any indication of that, we are going to lose our jobs and you know, we are not employable by the United States government. We cannot hold a security clearance. You know, there are, there's serious ramifications for that. Um, apparently, if you are in office, that's not necessarily the case. Um, and that's, that's a serious problem um, mm -hmm. when, you know, and, and we're used to a certain level of hypocrisy in politics when it comes to being government employees, but this is different. This is scary. This is, and, and it was scary with the Hatch Act. It was, it, that, that bothered me a lot over the last few years is how there was no ramifications. And if you don't know what the Hatch Act is uh, for the audience members, it's, uh, you, there's certain rules you can't violate to, to campaign um, during, use your government office for campaigning and to, to speak out for a candidate and whatnot. And, and it was violated over and over and over again mm -hmm. with, for instance, DHS secretary swearing people in the uh, Republican National Convention and things of that nature. Um, and there was all sorts of other norms violated, acting secretaries here and there and, yeah. and, and yeah, things yeah. that we just became desensitized to. So uh, this, this is different this time. Yeah. So Vic, what if he continues, what if, you know, the 45 continues to mobilize this right wing, these right wing militias against the United States. I mean, like what? And Sam, that's that's the question. Um, where are we as a nation? Right. I'm I'm an independent. I'm a registered independent. OK, I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Republican. OK, I I would vote either way, depending on who the candidate is. We, we could. Yeah, I'm not allowed to get involved in uh, in, in discussions of politics. Uh, the Hatch Act does apply to me, um, but I'm putting it out there, I'm an independent voter. So at the end of the day, um, you know, seeing what transpired and and agreeing a thousand percent with uh, with JJ, we've seen some things that transpired that we have never seen before. And I uphold, I, I swore an oath to my office that I uphold not to do certain things um, and to, to live by a code of ethics. And we've seen a lot of things that led up to where we were now let's talk about the point on January 6th when the president finally agreed to release a video denouncing so sort of sort of denouncing um, the uh, activity that was transpiring at the Capitol after that was after a sworn police officer lost his life. Um, I saw that video. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if anyone has heard that live or saw the video and was not, appalled by it or hurt by it. I, I, I just, I just question if you're, I, I question your ability to think outside of your own, you know, socioeconomic status in this world. Um, it was, it scared me again. It, had the president continued down that path, what might've happened and what still could potentially happen. We are so divided as a nation. My fear is that there is still, there still are numbers of people that believe truly in, res in insurrection, okay, anarchy, succession, whatever that might look like, civil war, whatever that might look like. Um, but there are individuals that believe that the country needs to be, uh, needs to go in a different direction, away from democracy, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And that, that frightens me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that I, I have... Uh just really been watching this and watching how things have just kind of settled down. And like I said, you know, gone from the top headline to the second tier headline to in some ways the third tier headline and thinking we, we need to actually get back to the top because th this is actually really, really serious. And, and. So 
I'm sorry, Sam. Go no, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead, Lori. I mean, I also just in terms of the, that, like this pandemic is also wrapped around us too, in terms sure. of like how we're dealing with it. So it is, it is difficult to keep anything at the top of a news cycle, if you will. That but, is true. But but I I do I do want to speak to. Um, you know, and Vic, you just said this, you know, I'm an independent. And I think what you are trying, what you're trying to uplift is that it sounds like, and it sounds like JJ, you were saying this too, that the two of you are, are appealing to some values that at least that should go beyond party and ideology. Right. And so I, I do think that there's many people in the country. I mean, the whole country, <laughs> there's people have a lot of complaints. Right. And so I, I guess I'm, I'm wanting to have us speak to or maybe the two of you speak to people who would be on the more conservative students who are on the more conservative side of the of the spectrum or lean more conservative because it feels like it's not possible to have this conversation without it being political. And I think what you're trying to tell us is there's some things that actually aren't <laughs> and that's an endless conversation. So I wonder if there's anything that the two of you could say kind of speaking directly to the more conservative students at class that would could acknowledge you know what you're what you're trying to communicate about some of those things that seem like they should cross all the lines i mean having you know having been on the more conservative side i mean i, I would i would say that i was moderate at best um for years um and then and been an administration of justice major and i know it's gone through several name changes since then crime law and justice cr criminology what is it now i have no idea i don't know myself one. yeah, yeah I, whatever it is. I, had, well, I was i started under admin j and was morphed into crj yeah so i i mean it's i i the only thing i can say is that you know it, it doesn't matter what your political ideology is as long you know just i try to look at things rationally and logically and scientifically and you know look at the core beliefs that i have and look for contradictions and you know do i believe in you know democracy people having you know a vote um do i believe in you know um ending racism the the, the things that you know i and just because you know there are certain people that say well you know i always voted you know this way or that way and i and i've voted i've voted for some republicans before i've you know and i've voted for democrats and and i've voted for third party candidates um i i try to look at things just analytically um across the board and uh i know i'm coming across extremely liberal on uh throughout this session um and uh and i i tell people that i am a 1994 for moderate, which makes me extremely liberal today, because somehow the entire political spectrum seems to have shifted on me, and I don't feel like I shifted, but I probably did. But um, something else shifted, um, you know, without me. But, um, but I, I just try, try to look at things analytically. But but one of the, in in what you're saying here though is important because in, this is not about politics here at all. This is about sociology. This is about hey, right. there is you need a sense of power in a country and we have a group of people who want to overthrow the power and start over in a different way. It doesn't matter who they say they are. This is really serious. We're talking about a revolution here. And, and, and <laughs> just to, I mean, complicated at, you know, almost the end of class, but, but, but from the other side, you know, from the side, so maybe I, these terms don't ever really fully fit, but just let's say from a more conservative side, you hear people on the left talking about over, you know, break the mm -hmm. system, blow up the system. We need a new system. So I don't, so it's interesting to me and I think important that we pay attention to just literally how it sounds from the other side. Of course, at the edges, there's the extreme, we talked about earlier, right? right with radicalization, there's people that want to do violence always at the extremes, but how does it sound to people on the other side when they hear we want, we got to just completely break the system? I, have, oh. I think it resonates in a similar way, if that's not what your sure. take on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I, and if, if anybody follows me on Twitter, you'll see I piss off the defund the police people too. So I, I mean, it, the ones who are truly defund the police, like abolish police. So it's, um, you know, it, there's extremes on both sides, like Vic said. So it, you know, that in neither of those is usually the right way. Yeah, but the power on both sides 
but power exists in those extremes in different ways. With, you know, these extreme quote unquote conservative militia groups have an exceptional amount of power. They do not equal Antifa. Whatever Antifa is, there is no comparison between the two. And so I, I'm just speaking as a sociologist who studies power and studies, you know, the militarization of the world. Hey, Jeff, do you have a, do, do we have a, a question from the stream that somebody could answer and but Vic hang will on. Yeah. Can I, can I, so, wait, hang on, hang on one second. Wait, so can we just finish this thought before we go? To, yeah. Because okay, I feel like ahead. it's hugely important. We only have four minutes. Go I, ahead. Yep. But I and I and I also want to hear from Vic. But but there, this is that we get ourselves. It's we have to pay attention to the extremes and to the threats and to the radicalization and to all of we have to have to have to right. Um, and mo the vast majority of people are not that. And so if we only speak to the extremes as if anybody who is conservative is this and anybody who's liberal is that and the mm -hmm. world is just divided like that, we are dead in the water <laughs> because most of us actually are moderate, thoughtful <laughs> thinking at least um, and only have two choices. And if we make the choices one extreme or the other, we're just, we're, it's, it's over. And so I'm always wanting to make that point. Like let's not get caught up in making sure, you know, thinking that conservative equals X and liberal equals Y, because it's not. Got it. It hijacks reality. Um, and I feel like that's really dangerous. Yeah. And I don't Thanks. think that's what we're doing through this conversation. I'm just saying, like, I feel like it can never be understated how mm. important that is. Yeah. I, I promise I could speak in 30 seconds or less, Sam, if you don't mind. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. I, I don't believe we're talking about conservatism when we're talking about what transpired at Correct. the Capitol. Mm -hmm. Correct. I don't believe that the former president was actually a Republican. I don't think that uh, George W. Bush or George Bush or Ronald Reagan would have supported any of those antics. So I don't want people to be afraid to be uh, a Republican or, or afraid to be a, a, affiliated with being conservative based on what's transpired. Yeah, agree. Absolutely. We, Ab cannot, yeah. we have to have conservative thinking and liberal thinking and it all has to you know come together to support the whole. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that 30 second. Dude, message. important. Jeff, what do we got from the stream? Well, one question is a little political. Um, it did, it asked, do you think the thin blue line flag is political or more of a stance to back the blue? Okay, I, this is something that I feel pretty strongly about. Um, it's been, I, I think it's become political. Um, it's, it has roots that are pretty racist. Um, it was popular li popularized in, uh, by the the whole thin blue line saying I should say was popularized uh, by a, a very racist police chief in LA in the 1950s, um, and I think it conveys the wrong message anyway. It, it conveys a line almost between the public and police. Uh, and Vic may disagree with me on this. I, I I don't I don't anything like that in the Punisher symbol, which has it, which which symbolizes vigilantism. So it doesn't make any sense anyway. Um, those things that uh, it's, some people think it uh, creates camaraderie or the sense of belonging, that's not what, it's certainly not today, is not what is needed in law enforcement. Um, the, it, law enforcement says be representative of the community, part of the community, and anything that separates it from the community is going to be problematic. Mm -hmm. Where do you get your news? Hang on. Wait, next question. Vic, do you want to respond yeah, to Vic, the thin blue line? Yeah. I, I feel like, I, I, feel like I, I, I have to, and uh, you know, uh, I think having both sides of the coin, the thin blue line, I know a lot of people that do display it proudly. Uh, identifying yourself as law enforcement is difficult uh, to do without showing your badge, um, but showing a thin blue line sometimes is a way to have pride and make connections with other fellow law enforcement. There is a sense of, I do have a sense of pride of being law enforcement. With that said, I do not fly the thin blue line. I do not wear it myself, but that's because I prefer to be the one that knows that I'm law enforcement before somebody else does just for my own safety and security. Yep. Hey, my cla hey, class, by the way, Top Hat does not give you a notification, my friends. That's why you watch the stream. The notification comes from my lips saying the question's coming up. Read my lips. Who said that? Oh, that was George Bush. Jeff, do you have another question from the stream? It's 
420, just to say. Yeah, it's 420. Sorry, guys. The class ends at 420. I know that means something to the potheads in the class, but to you guys, it doesn't mean anything. I guess just the last question is right. you get or where do you get your news? Yeah. <laughs> um, I I get it from CNN. I read um, a lot of I actually get it from a lot of sources via Twitter now um, because it pulls it from um, a lot of different sources and even Fox News um, as painful as that is sometimes. Um, so I, I try to try I try to make sure I get it from a variety of sources, including conservative sources. And uh, um, that way I'm getting getting a variety of it. Vic, how about you? Oh, there you go. <laughs> so those, those uh, communication majors that we have out there, please don't take this the wrong way. Uh, I, I hate I hate the news. I'll be honest. I I do I despise watching the news. Um, do I watch it? Yes. Um, why? Just because I need to know what's being said out there. But I do not like the fact that the news uh, tells you what to think. I see a little spot of news, and then I see uh, people, you know, telling you how to interpret that news that you that they've just provided to you. I don't like it. I believe it's a root cause of a lot of the racial divide that we have in the United States. I can tell you from my childhood, uh, growing up, those images that were repeatedly on the news of a, of a black male that was committing some type of a heinous act um, in a town where there's all types of crime, but there's only some small percentage of crime made by these people. I, I, I just see that as, as, as shaping, it's psychological operations, it's uh, breeding and creating uh, racist ideals in young people and older people, and I really despise the news. I'm not a fan of it at all. And uh, if you go into that profession, you know, please prove me wrong. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Hey, any, maybe we can, we could, we can stay on. I mean, you know, technically speaking, you know, class is over. If you guys have another couple minutes, we can just stay on. If people want to stay on and watch and maybe ask, throw some questions out. Lori Lynn. What is your question for me? Well, no. So I, I, just, I, just, I just, I just, I think we could, we should round it out so that people can, you know, just I get you all have agreed to be here for a certain amount of time, so I always like to stay with what you. Agreed yeah. So to. class is officially over. I'm rounding it out. Class is officially over. So anyone who's in class and you want to leave, you can leave. But we're gonna stay on for another few minutes just to maybe respond to a few more questions um, on one of the chats. And maybe a couple of things that the two of you didn't say. If you have another a few more minutes, I actually would. So, if you want to, with a with a few minutes, I would say, what do you feel that needs to be said that wasn't said yet, or that you didn't get to, that you would really say, like, I want, I want, I want this to be known. I want this to be understood. I, I vote for questions. Uh, going back to the question poll, I thought that was uh, very invigorating. Uh, getting the questions from the from. Okay. Jeff, do you have a couple other ones that you would share? Um, the two questions I have is, JJ, how hard was it to get into the Secret Service? And what was one thing you were not prepared for or you were prepared for before training or whatever? And then the second one is about the incident that happened in New York yesterday with the nine-year-old girl. Um, I can answer the first one, not the second one. Um, the first one, um, the getting into Secret Service was um, fairly hard. I mean, I'd been a police officer for a few years in Chesterfield County, Virginia. Um, the process was um, pretty, pretty, pretty quick at the time um, compared to what it is today. Um, but you, you have to go through a pretty extensive background and polygraph exam and physical, and uh, it, it takes some time. And there's a trying to think what else was involved with that, but um, it. It's pretty. It's pretty selective. Um, I keep it. You know, I had a clean background, which helped. Um, didn't have any drug use or anything, which helped. Um, if there was anything I wasn't prepared for, um, you know, I was pretty young. I got, I got into Secret Service at 25, um, so I probably wasn't used to the. Even though I'd been a police officer for a few years, the the believe it or not, the paperwork, the physical demands were fine. The travel was fine. Uh, the protection duties were fine. It was just the the investigative paperwork, the bureaucracy, the government bureaucracy that that took some time. I, I, um, any kind of federal bureaucracy, there's there's some 
things you have to navigate and the, some, some politics has never been my thing. Uh, inner office politics, you have to navigate, um, not my strong suit, but, um, probably, probably some things like that, that, uh, I didn't, didn't care for. Hey, can, can I ask a, a question that I, there did you, is there a question on the table? Vic, yeah, I don't know if Vic was going to answer the second mm -hmm. one or I, I don't know if that's what I actually, yeah. Know. So. No, I, I, the the nine year old girl pepper spray in Rochester. That, that was what the question is about use of force. Um, you know that again that goes back to what J, what JJ mentioned before. I mean we're we're trained on on use of force, and um, you we're trained to use the minimum amount of force necessary. So uh, whether it's a if it's a if it's a excessive force situation with the knee on the neck handcuffs. Uh, pepper spraying a nine-year-old girl. I think all those. I mean, there might be some factors. I don't. I. I don't know. Uh, I. I haven't seen the body cam footage. I know it's on the news, but um, if it doesn't look right, then there, there's a good chance that it was excessive. And and usually, uh, training is a, is a factor. But um, I can't can't really speak on it more than that. Mm. Hey, so a, a question that I have for the two of you is, what do you just in a most general sense, like if you take your network out and just spread it out amongst your friends and colleagues and in law enforcement and so on. How many, what percentage of them do you know that are continuing to support this movement to do the recount that Trump's still president that like they, they don't really see a problem here or something, right? Is there, what, what you know, what's, what's the law enforcement? Cause you guys clearly, Hey, we got a problem here, but are other folks who's, thinking that we don't really have a problem in it, or the problem actually is that Trump should still be president and so on and so forth. I don't know. However you want to see that. Well, keeping in mind, I'm in Georgia. Um, it's pretty conservative here overall. Um, so there's still a lot who are still drifting that way and still, still hanging on. Um, I don't surround myself with that too often. So I tend to, my, my closer circle of friends is, they're, they, they're not they're not they're not the people who believe that what do they think should happen to these demonstrators that the, the the rioters the people that broke into the capitol um i to not to be honest i haven't discussed it with them and that's probably mm -hmm. on me uh probably should ask more questions but i don't want to get too upset or maybe you don't right you don't want to know yeah. right vic how about you i mean there's a there's a common consensus of uh of embarrassment as to what transpired. So um, I don't know if it's the the popular, the popular versus unpopular, but the popular thing is to just stand together and say, and understand that what transpired um, at the Capitol was, was awful. So I haven't had anyone ever uh, since it's transpired or while it was transpiring say, you know, get in there and rip that, you know, <laughs> rip that process to shreds. Nobody, nobody supports that. Not nobody that I would be friends with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I mean, it's a question I have, right? I mean, clearly, it's a lot of it depends on what part of the country you're in and 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 who you're working with and so on. But it'd be hard for me to 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 imagine. Hey, and another thought I had was that maybe the two of you can respond to this. And I know maybe we probably have more questions from the stream, but I've been thinking that wow, yeah. it's Sorry yeah, not to interrupt you, but I I have to leave, so I'm gonna awkwardly let you continue the conversation. Sorry, I have to be the one to do that, but I'm gonna let you. So, thanks the two of you for for all the cool things that you've shared, and I really appreciate it. And we'll let you know what some of the conversations are following this. Thanks, Lori. Thanks Thank for you. Uh, participating. Appreciate it. I so I was thinking. Wow, it's really pretty good that folks showed a lot of restraint because if there would have been a really high body count inside the Capitol, um, we, I can't even imagine what the conversation would be today, what people would be saying. Um, people who are part of these movements, right? And part of that and supporting that, you know, imagine that a 50 or 100 of them had died and the people who breached the Capitol and they were inside. And it was, you know, kind of a bloodbath. And I was so thankful that the police just held back because of that. But 
I don't know. Like, do you, are there any thoughts on that? Do, are people talking about it from inside of? I haven't, I haven't heard anybody talking about it, but I do wonder about the power of martyrdom. If, if, you know, there would, if it wouldn't be, if people wouldn't be speaking of it as negatively, if, you know, like you said, 50 or a hundred you know, rioters would have died if all of a sudden they would have been, you know, look at these heroes. Yeah. Who, you know, and, and the move, you know, the extreme part of the movement would have, wouldn't have idolized them. And, yeah. uh, instead of saying, well, this was a failed coup and, you know, instead of some people abandoning this movement, they would have latched onto it even more. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's my thinking. And it would build up more and more power. And, you know. and I'll, Sam, I, I'll, I'll get back on my soapbox. The one that probably, I, I probably, uh, upset a lot of students when I say this, but, you know, as I said this before with the, uh, with, with the media, but, you know, if, if the media had taken this situation again, we're going back to uh, Ashley Babbitt and, and put her on, on the front page and showing about this and et cetera, it, it, it could have had some type of reaction. But um, the question like I put into the, into the chat is, you know, you know, paraphrasing, if this had been a, a black movement, you know, I won't, I don't want to specify it into BLM, but if this had been any type of demonstration and that person was a black um, protester and mm -hmm. was shot and killed by a white officer, right? And if this, and if that person was a 14 year vet of the air force and, had, and was unarmed and had been shot, I can almost guarantee you just based on everything that I've seen throughout my life, that that would have been beating everybody's, front page news on every station, every news feed would have been putting up this black person that was killed by white officers uh, doing, a, doing a demonstration and it would have incited violence and riots across the nation. Mm -hmm. I hate going to the political, uh, into the yeah. hypothetical situation, but I'm just saying there was not, the, you know, you mentioned that there was a lack of response um, you know, if you, yeah. if you use strategic communication to incite people based on circumstances, yeah. there, what's going to be the end effect? You're going to have cities burning across the United States uh, because of that injustice. Well, there, there's a way in which some of these folks like her were thrown under the bus very quickly, even by the whole movement, like the disavowing folks. Um, and, and, you know, and then the other side, you know, white people... This is something that we see a lot. White people don't mobilize against the police at all because we, we white people are more likely to believe that the system will work itself out, right? We don't have a long history of institutional racism. We have a long history of the system operating for us and by us. And so it's going to benefit us. And so if we get in trouble, hey, just work your way through the system, right? So if you... If, if, if a police officer kills my child or my friend, well, we're going to go through the courts and we're going to we're going to work it out and that we're going to get justice for for my for my child or my friend. That's how that's a, a more of a white way of thinking. But, you know, black and brown folks are saying, like, mm, we've got two, 200 plus years of not getting justice, like we way beyond 200 years. So, like, we're not going to get justice. We get, we, we got to go out in the streets. We got to mobilize, right? And so I think we kind of see that here a little bit. Yeah. Hmm. Jeff, is there any question from the stream you can kick up really fast? Because I, I also have another meeting I have to go to. What's that? Dude, all right. Well, we got nothing else. I mean, there's a ton. I'm sure the stream was popping, but, you know, a lot of times people don't throw stuff out. Gentlemen, listen, thank you. Uh, just thanks for thanks for being on. Thanks for. Uh, thank you. Hope you. I didn't. I we tried not to ask. Sure. Any, well, whatever. We left it up to you to decide what you could and couldn't say. So that was. That's on you. No. Uh, no, I'm an open book. Vic doesn't tell you anything. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, listen. Maybe we'll see how this thing plays out. We may be calling on you again in a couple months to say, all right, hang on, we got to come back in and pick up the second part of the conversation because shit has just gotten real. Hey, anytime. And I, I, we were going to talk about the NFAC movement, you know, folks, right? They, they, I got some good images for them, but it was really killing our stream to do that. But, you know, we'll, maybe that's what we'll talk about. All right, listen, thanks. And uh, we, I'll, we'll be in touch. Really appreciate right. it. 
Awesome. Great to see you all. JJ, nice to meet you. I uh, wish you. everyone the best and, and uh, reach out anytime, Sam. Yeah, thanks, man. Be well. Be safe. You Take well. care. Right, Goodbye.